I'd like to welcome you to the, um, the closing, closing plenary sessions of the Eden um, Annual Conference 2021. I think we've got a, a nice final session uh, prepared for you, and I, I hope you'll enjoy it. And uh, in fact, I hope the whole conference has been, has been very enjoyable. So without more ado, I'll, I'll pass over to, uh, to Sandra, who's going to moderate the, uh, the keynote session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. So welcome to the uh, closure uh, plenary uh, of Eden Conference 2021. Uh, I'm certain that uh, during all these days you have found very interesting uh, topics to follow, uh, whether it was the, the presentations, keynotes, workshops, uh, some other sessions. Uh, and uh, for, the, for, the, for the last uh, uh, keynote, um, I have asked my dear colleagues, uh, Mark Nichols from Open University uh, 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 Polytechnic of New Zealand and Antonio Teixeira from Open University Alberta to do something a little bit different, uh, not just uh, giving uh, the speech, but to engage in a dialogue and uh, to talk about uh, the, the, the phrase, the the buzzwords uh, which are very uh, present uh, at the moment uh, about digital uh, transformation, about uh, emergency remote teaching, about new normal. So all these words which we are using quite often uh, for the last year and a half. And before I gave them uh, the word, word to start uh, with uh, their plenary, let me just briefly introduce them uh, to you. So Mark Nichols is Executive Director of Learning Design and Development at the Open Tele Polytechnic of New Zealand since 19, uh, 2019. He was Director of Technology Enhanced uh, Learning at the Open University UK and Executive Director of Open Polytechnic of New Zealand from 2010 to 2016. So he is just moving across the New Zealand and UK back and forth. So maybe in the next few years, we will see you again in, in, in the UK. He has valuable experience in executive management, professional team leadership, change management, organizational design and research. Mark holds a PhD in distance education from University of Tago, New Zealand. He's author of more than 29 publications in e-pedagogy, and he has recently published the book Transforming Universities, with digital distance education, the future of formal learning. And Antonio uh, Teixeira is Eden Senior Fellow and former Eden President. He's Professor of Education and Distance Learning at Universitate Aberta Portugal. Uh, so uh, he's there, he's at the University Aberta uh, uh, professor uh, with tenure since uh, 1991. He is a member of the Department of Education and Distance Learning, which he headed from 2016 to 2020. He is also a researcher at the University of Lisbon Center of Phil Philosophy and collaborates with the University of Roma Tre, as well as the Distance and E-Learning Lab at uh, Universidad de Aberta. He was visiting scholar at the Korean National Open University as well. From 2006 to 2009, he was Prorector for Innovation in Distance Learning and Universitate Alberta. And in this capacity, he conceived the strategy and managed the university's successful and speedy transition process from the print based distance learning institutions to the fully online one. He was also responsible for design and initial implementation of the University Research Lab on the Distance Education and the University Open Access Scientific Repository. He has numerous of papers, books, and everything else. I could read for whole hour uh, your CV, Antonio, so I shortened it, I'm sorry. But uh, as I already said, he's a former Eden president before he was a vice president from 2010 to 2013, and before that, director of 2008 to 2016. He is currently serving as a member of the Council of Eden Fellows. He was also director at IPSTB, International Board of Standards for Training, Performance and Instruction, and is currently their scholar. So, um, Definitely uh, the people with very hard and very good background in, in education, in the topics uh, which are very important to us uh, today. And uh, now I would like uh, you guys to, to have your uh, 
start start the show as as we can say uh, give your introductionary speeches and then start uh, with dialogue uh, between you so please who is going to be the first one mark will start <laughs> okay, mark so you can start <laughs> because okay, he's, he's, you, he's late in the day <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's, it's currently midnight here in New Zealand. Uh, can I just confirm that people can see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Just just before you start, I have to say uh, all the questions you can for for keynotes you can post in the chat. Uh, definitely, I'm certain there will be a number of questions, but so that people uh, know that they can uh, ask them. So, Mark, please, floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, well, kia ora. Uh, ko mak Nichols toko ingoa no Aotearoa ahau. Ko au te kaiwhakahaere mātua o whakapakari akoranga ki te kuratini tūwhera o Aotearoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. My time will be spent explaining why we are unlikely to see digital transformation in education and why the changes from the pandemic are not likely to blossom into the educational practice people in the 21st century might reasonably expect. So we know technology is an incredible enabler. Over the past 20 years, our consumer experience is completely different thanks to the internet. So we stream our media rather than purchase it. We buy directly from travel providers rather than going through an agency. We seldom visit physical banks. We think nothing of buying online rather than through a retail outlet. We've got an incredible amount of consumer power available through the phones we carry. We watch and listen to anything we want to, anywhere, anytime. So where's the disruption to education? So why can we not make any course available to any learner anywhere in the world at any time through our universities? Why are we limited to semesters, lectures, essays, exams, and ever-increasing costs? Why is quality, sustainable education not on demand and flexible? So digital transformation in education is clearly not inevitable. Otherwise, it probably would have happened by now. I think the pandemic has also failed to disrupt education along the lines I've mentioned. So I believe there are five key reasons why we are yet to see education transformed in ways we might think obvious. Firstly, there's the dynamic of the qualified specialist. We treat higher education as if it's limited to the productivity of an individual. In reality, academic knowledge is now very scalable, but our universities are designed as if it isn't. So lectures remain a main feature of this thinking. Second, there's no crisis of demand. Enrollments remain high as demand for university education continues to grow worldwide. So there's no immediate incentive to attract more students or improve flexibility in the system. Third, there's supply-side adoption. Technology is applied to higher education, but mainly in ways that suit the university. Our approach to technology adoption is to harness it within how we currently work, not use it as the means of rethinking everything. Fourth, there are high barriers to entry. It's very difficult for new competitors to develop the brand and quality reputations they need if they're going to disrupt incumbent practice. In the university sector, reputation counts for a lot. It takes a lot of time to develop a quality reputation and a research culture that will attract students. Starting a university also requires significant infrastructure and a major outlay at the start. And finally, I think of systematic inertia. So achieving all that might be achieved requires changes to funding and operating practices that are very complex and difficult to change. We all operate within a system that's largely immune from disruption. So the dynamics and incentives of the private sector are not available to us. So I think there is plenty we can be doing and should be abdicating for, even within these five areas. I also think there's every value in parts of what we already have in higher education. We have qualifications, we have credits, we have enrollment, we have accreditation. There's something to the quality outcomes we work to that makes education valuable. The assignment work students do is a valuable part of their learning. Courses provide logical stepping stones toward qualifications. Now these, I think, are the sorts of things worth continuing in higher education. A bachelor's degree, master's degree, and doctoral qualification, they need to continue to stand for something. 
Now, the recent pandemic did not challenge any of these five points. All the pandemic provided was an immediate crisis of distribution. Once face-to-face -face classes can continue, we'll see this problem with distribution disappear. So lectures will again be scheduled, even if fewer students might choose to attend them. To achieve true transformation, I think we need to address these five barriers. So I think we can have a quality, accessible, scalable and personalised higher education system through digital transformation if we start by challenging each of these five assumptions. Firstly, the dynamic of the qualified specialist. What if we assumed the qualified specialist was part of the education system rather than the focus of it? So what if we began with a genuine debate about what it means to teach and learn in higher education and how these might best be facilitated? Secondly, talking to no crisis of demand. What if we sought to meet all of the demand through a new education system rather than assuming it should support our current ways of doing things? So what if our starting point was the convenience, cost effectiveness and the value add experience we've seen transform all other product and service industries? Thirdly, for supply side adoption, what if we thought about the education experience from the real life learner perspective? So instead of starting with how universities operate, what if we started with how learners might best be educated? For high barriers to entry, what if we sought to compete with ourselves from a, from a true student-centred focus? So if we really challenged ourselves and tried to be the university technology might enable us to be without compromising our standards, what approaches would we take a fresh look at? And finally, looking at systematic inertia, what if we had ways of changing ourselves such that we better worked within existing quality and funding systems? Well, this last part I think I can help with. My book, Transforming Universities with Digital Distance Education, contains a practical vision and a description of how the sort of change required to bring digital distance education about might take place. So in my thinking, education is the starting point, and it serves to engage, enlighten, and empower. Education is like training for the brain, not to fill it, but to help it think differently. So as a result of education, you don't just know more, you think differently, and hopefully you think better. Any transformed education system must still have this as the outcome, a graduate who is confident with knowledge and able to think beyond it. Now, I'm no expert on the sort of change required here. I've been involved with two large-scale institutional transformations. One failed, and one, though successful, is still unfolding. I've been involved in multiple other changes in higher education institutions, and I can tell you, as, as most of you will already know, transformation and change of any kind is extremely difficult. But if we're going to determine what a digital transformation in education should resemble, we should first start by thinking about just what education is. Unless we first consider education, we'll not be successful in applying digital transformation or doing anything that's truly different with technologies. So I think we do need to think transformatively. There's so much demand for higher education and it's becoming ever more expensive and inconvenient for learners. There is no reason why through effective digital education approaches, people should not have immediate and cost-effective access to quality education. So let me close with these five points, which sum the main parts of my brief presentation. And perhaps I can leave these on uh, for a few questions or comments. Uh, kia ora koutou, health and life to us all. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mark. Interesting points uh, already to think about. Uh, now uh, let's move to Antonio to see his, uh, his introductionary speech. Well, thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, bon dia, boa tarde, buenas tardes. <laughs> good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and good morning and good good evening for, for in the case of Mark. <laughs> it's really good night almost. Um, well, I would like to start by thanking the the kind invitation uh, the, uh, the, to to address the the closing um, uh, keynote session of the, of the of the conference this year. I'd like also to congratulate Sandra for the thirtieth thirtieth anniversary of Eden and also team uh, and the colleagues of UNET for this uh, another 
uh, successful, very successful uh, uh, and memorable uh, conference, uh, Eden conference. Well, uh, following up on um, on this um, uh, first address by uh, by Mark, I'm going to now um, share my slides. Okay, I think you, you can see them. Okay, okay. So I'll start uh, already on the title. Uh, the title that I've um, well chosen for this uh, brief presentation is reflecting on the digital uh, transformation in higher education so much more than the transition this was the title that we've selected for 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 this uh, keynote this shared keynote is also an experiment that we're uh, conducting uh, and basically i would start by addressing the topic from the point of view of what is really happening uh, at this moment. So after the pandemic, now what? And um, we have already, and this is the uh, interesting uh, quote from Karen Wetzel uh, from EduCourse, uh, we can already uh, see some evidences that uh, digital transformation is being embraced by, by the field. As she said, institutions that hadn't been considering digital, uh, digital um, transformation to any significant measure are now faced with shifting in that direction out of the necessity. As we look toward a very uncertain future, we are already seeing evidence that institutions are prioritizing efforts that bring the greatest value and most tangible results in a deep and coordinated fashion. And in this way, she concludes, they are in effect embracing digital transformation intentionally or not as a matter of survival. And I think this is uh, the first point that I'd like to make. Of course, obviously, when uh, just I and Mark talk about digital uh, transformation, we should clearly uh, understand this, uh, that the, this is the result of a, of, a, of a pathway. This is the result of a, a road that is being um, uh, crossed. In this sense, there are different phases and the, the famous 3Ds are uh, clearly important in how we can assess uh, the status, uh, status of the art, uh, status of art of this uh, of this process. So there is a first phase in which which is called digitization, which is basically um, the process of changing from analog to digital format. There is the process of digitalization in, in which the processes are already re-engineered in a way, and then there is the digital transformation in which there is not only an optimization but there is a transformation. Of the of, of the operations of how uh, the directions are strategically taken, what is the value proposition, and uh, so it's a more cultural approach. Uh, and so it, it is in this um, this line that uh, my point is uh, that we are already starting a process of digital transformation in many universe in many higher education institutions across the world. So we can look at the field and already see that uh, regarding the first phase, uh, most uh, higher education institutions are already digitized. From learning materials to administrative documents, everything is produced in digital format these days. Of course, there are still some variations according to region, but when talking about regions as Europe, this is more, more or less uh, mainstream. Also, many of the manual and paper-based processes have been automated, uh, and this has all, also been uh, the result of this um, accelerated change uh, due to the pandemic. In this sense, also most higher education institutions have engaged in process of digitalization, in the sense that they are using digital technologies and data, not simply uh, as a way of moving activities online, but also generating integrated digital environments where information is at the core. Of course, COVID-19 uh, and the massive experience of emergency, emergency remote teaching and learning has expanded and accelerated dramatically this trend across the field, in my view. Uh, but I also uh, see that the shortcomings of this experience have also led or are leading stakeholders, and I here include, of course, from policy makers, uh, uh, from, uh, from decision, policy decision makers to institutional leadership to teachers to students uh, um, to communities of families and communities they are most of them are realizing the need to conduct a deeper a deeper cultural change and as in, in this sense this is the the realization that is also inspiring this uh, um, uh, move uh, towards digital transformation in the case of Europe 
uh, in particular, there is also uh, the element of policy. And here, uh, European policy is playing a critical role also in supporting this strategy. And it, it's not just a supporting in terms of, uh, uh, of well, directives, uh, broad directives, but also in, in, in uh, it's also producing tools that are valuable. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we were, or the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, um, we had already uh, in Europe uh, an European framework for digital content, content educational organizations, which is a, a very interesting reference mm -hmm. to how institutions can transform and should transform, uh, uh, and in this sense, how it can uh, be used as a reference for the digital transformation processes. And since the, uh, the approach is an holistic one, uh, it is clearly uh, an updated and, and relevant reference to, to this process. On the other hand, uh, the new Digital Education Action Plan 2021-27, um, which was actually presented uh, at, at one of the Eden conferences, uh, or one of the even events, online events, is uh, also a remarkable tool in in what in respect to pushing forward uh, the field uh, towards digital transformation. Not just the field, but society in general. And the, the, this holistic approach is very important. But how can we anticipate these digital futures of higher education institutions? Well, first of all, um, my first point would be that the digital futures of higher education institutions are not about building teaching machines in this sense uh, as in the past, but basically the purpose of digital transformation is not necessarily automating processes, but adding data intelligence to these processes and how they're managed. Also, in, uh, another point is that uh, institutions are going to reinvent and redesign themselves. And this is a, a critical point for uh, enabling digital transformation. They will unbundle and rebundle services. They will specialize in only certain of their current functions. functions. They will share resources openly in collaborative networks. They will uh, reorganize the, not only the way they operate, but also the way they work and their organizational culture in, in this sense as well trying to um, um, to rethink uh, their um, their mission values uh, in, in the framework of uh, exploring digital possibilities. Also, they will evolve to a hybrid format. And I think this is a very important aspect that we learned from the pandemic. It's not either fully online or face-to-face, -face, this uh, uh, dual, uh, the old duality. It's not even a blended format is, as we've seen in the pandemic, a much more diverse, complex, and flexible learning scenarios in which all of the different possibilities are used to design very specific learning scenarios in this sense. So this hybrid format is much more complex, much more rich than a traditional blended approach as we, we've traditionally uh, learn to, use, to, to, to apply it. Also, they will further enrich the living experience of learners. And the digital trans transformation is, in, is an enabler of, of this process. They will have, students will have increased participation in designing, assessing their own, and assessing their own learning experience, uh, which themselves will also become more open, authentic, flexible, differentiated, and personalized. The institutions will also change the way they assess and certificate uh, learning achievement. This is uh, also a critical point, and I will not get into details, but basically we will be moving from traditional diplomas to new open formats as micro-credentials and others. But at the, at the, uh, at the same time, te as teachers will continue to ch change their role, they will also, also remain critical, uh, a critical element for the sustainability and the quality of, of uh, higher education institutions. I strongly believe that machines will interact with teachers and students. They will assume some of the current learning support tasks, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, the pivotal element will remain uh, the, the human element. Well, this is a good example of what is already happening in non-formal uh, uh, learning institutions as museums. Uh, uh, these, well, these devices are used in a very interactive way and people interact with, with, with the machines in a very, uh, well, uh, simple way and very natural way, but this is not replacing the human element uh, uh, as we know. What can prevent us from getting there? 
Well, first of all, the lack of integrated policies and an holistic uh, or holistic institutional strategies. The lack of public investment on infrastructure and resources, as we've seen uh, during the pandemic. Also, uh, the possible uh, forgetting that the decisive element is always the human. Uh, and so digital transformation has to have at the core also a move to open and digital scholarship or building of these uh, elements. Uh, also, an increased divide between research and innovation and educational practices. There is a, a clear danger that this uh, experience of emerging remote teaching and learning may lead to a disregard of what is research-based expertise. And this is a critical uh, element that should be um, ad advocated by institutions as, as or organizations as Eden. Also another uh, danger is the sole focus on technology or methodology as a drivers <clears throat> for digital transformation. Uh, if, if any, it's ethics and safety who should be uh, uh, also uh, um, taken as, as, as uh, co-drivers in this transformation, especially when we're talking about artificial intelligence and its integration in introduction to teaching and learning processes. Also another danger is the lack of openness and networking this is clear. Um, we are not alone, and we'll we will not uh, be alone in the future. Uh, if, if if anything, we'll be ever more uh, part of networks and and uh, institutions, higher education institutions, which also did solve in a way as part of these new smart cities knowledge ecosystems. And also, as as Mark has pointed out, uh, the, the importance of traditional and systematic inertia uh, as a possible uh, danger. Just to finalize, as Mark also uh, mentioned, uh, the case for digital open and distance education. Uh, well, he, he made the case for digital distance education and also at open. Uh, looking at this um, more uh, fluid and also hybrid landscape, uh, what is the role of uh, uh, specialized distance education institutions or specialized uh, uh, um, digital um, universities? Well, they are not obsolete, and I'm talking spe specifically about the traditional open universities, but they have to differentiate uh, in, in this emerging uh, new landscape. Um, there's still a lack of uh, uh, higher education provision for groups at risk, as we've seen uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the, also, the pandemic has also proven the high level of inequity of digital higher education access and participation. This can only be addressed by specialized institutions as well, open universities. Um, and in this sense, they should be also in the front run for response to rapidly, rapidly developing social needs and complex societal, change, societal challenges as the, the pandemic uh, proven us. Uh, challenges that require an urgent, flexible, personalized as much as scalable approach. Finally, um, this education, higher education institutions or specialized ones need to implement more innovative organizational models that high, are highly responsive to environmental change and thus holistic and organic. And I believe that the final goal for digital transformation of higher education institutions will be also, uh, or be very much uh, to make them more responsive to change uh, to the environmental, uh, the change in, in the environment, and also very much more adaptable um, to, to this change. And thank you very much. And I will now stop uh, sharing and get, uh, give back the, the word to you, Sandra. Thank you. Very, thank you for a very interesting and provoking uh, introduction. And uh, now I hope you can engage in conversation or do you need me uh, to facilitate? Uh, so please let me know. Well, I, I mean, I can start <laughs> in a sense. No, uh, I can with, start with one question okay. for both of you, and then, then we can continue. So um, uh, it was interesting uh, to see uh, all the obstacles, uh, possible uh, obstacles uh, why digital transformation did not start or is not happening uh, in spite of uh, uh, pandemic. On the other side, it was good to see uh, what can be the benefits uh, and what are the need, needed steps uh, 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 to, uh, to be taken. Um, in in uh, your uh, uh, perspective, do you think the digital transformation is crucial for uh, education to uh, remain as such? You know, can we have education without digital transformation? And why is it needed that we move uh, 
and this, this, that we evolve, that we uh, expand, uh, and that we transform uh, uh, education process. Process. Mm. So maybe Mark, you can you can start first. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. I think in response to your question, can we continue education without transformation? I think that is the case now. I think we're yet to see a true digital transformation in higher education. When we consider uh, how other parts of our lives have changed, how other industries, other sectors are completely different now uh, compared to what they were 20 years ago, you don't see a similar shift having taken place in higher education. Um, I, I think that the reasons why we would do this, uh, it, there's every possibility for us to improve the accessibility to education, the scalability of education, uh, also the personalization of education through technology. And we're yet to really express how that might work in the higher education system. And some of it, I think, is because our universities and ways of working are just too ingrained. They're just too firmly entrenched. Uh, it's very difficult as an individual academic to be truly innovative in your practice because you might find yourself working against the university you're a part of. So there's some very complex issues here that uh, restrict us from being truly transformative, from being truly disruptive, uh, truly accessible for education for our learners. Well, uh, picking up on the on Mark's um, point, uh, I would uh, div um, I would div diverge. Uh, on uh, possibly a more optimistic note, uh, when I um, when I say that uh, it is already happening, um, I, it's clear for me that two, two two important factors must be must be taken into consideration. First of all, uh, change takes time, and so uh, you can change uh, the technology, you can change methods uh, quite easily and much rapidly, but uh, changing minds, people's minds, changing uh, people's ways of judgment, their culture of work, of living, that takes much more time. And so uh, a transformation is only uh, sustainable in the, long run, in the long term when you complete this third element as well. So that's why uh, when we, even in a, a traditional setting, when we're talking about uh, transforming an institution, uh, we have to also establish different stages uh, of transformation, which are connected or linked uh, to the different layers of this transformation within the organization structure. Um, in this sense, I think that we are already seeing some elements of this change, but of course, not all the change is 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 happening, and it's happening at the same time. And, and so, my point, my perspective is not entirely different from Marx. Uh, what I see here is a differentiated process, a more complex one, and Marx is looking at a, a broader uh, perspective uh, uh, regarding the, the total um, completion uh, of this uh, change process. Uh, in my, uh, I would also add uh, that sometimes change does not happen because of a reason, um, a very straightforward reason. Sometimes it happens because everyone is changing around you and you have to adapt as well. Uh, and, um, and in that, in that uh, perspective, uh, I would also um, restrain from comparing directly, as Mark is doing, um, the education sector with other sectors that were subject to digital transformation, because it's a different environment. If you look at uh, higher education institutions in particular, uh, there, I mean, there have been studies from our uh, uh, from many sociologists that have, pro have proven that the more stable, more conservative uh, inst uh, institutions in our society are universities. Uh, and I'm not saying this in a bad way. Uh, in uh, of, they are um, they are conceived to be stable. Uh, and that is why they are so conservative in this sense. So changing universities is not a, is not as easy as changing a business. Uh, and I I do not see universities as typically a business. They are there is also business <laughs> uh, involved, but they are not typically a business. And so in that sense, I would also say uh, that um, the the pandemic was a driver. Uh, I agree with Mark that mostly what was at stake was dis distribution. Um, but on the other hand, <clears throat> um, there was a, a such um, a high impact experience of, of, uh, of change 
in the way people um, actually um, practiced education, teaching and learning, that this has generated also some kind of internal reaction that is leading many people, many of, uh, of these actors, to start questioning their own practice. So, and as we know from educational theory, this is a, a stepping stone for transformation to have people reflecting on their practice and starting to see, mm, I could do this differently. This could, could work better. This makes more sense. And the, but in order to have a clear glimpse of that impact, we also need time. It doesn't happen overnight. People have need time to think. And that is the time that we have an award in them still. But even so, I, I see, uh, of course, I mean, uh, most of this data is very much empirical. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, reflected a lot. There's not many, there's a lot of literature, but not many reflection on, on this uh, impact of the pandemic. But I do see that it has not only um, drive, driv, driven in, in a way a, a change in the modes of distribution, but it has also set new um, perspectives on what is uh, uh, educational about and uh, how should we conduct it. Well, I don't know if you agree with me, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I do. Yeah, um, we have really good questions in the chat. So maybe uh, uh, to take uh, uh, away from you, I will start with the one which was uh, uh, asked by Alfredo uh, at the beginning. You know about teacher preparedness. Uh, for, for teaching uh, in this way. But also uh, to think about, um, you can remember that uh, we had the, the teacher-centered model of, of teaching and learning. And we said, okay, we do not want this model anymore. We now want to shift to students. We want student-centered model and everything is about student. But in the end, now we are concluding that without teachers, there is no good education and that teachers need to be prepared. They have to be innovative, as you, Mark, already he said we want actually to be them the superheroes you know uh, who has all the possible skills and competences to provide our students uh, for the future so what do you think why did we not uh, prepare our teachers uh, uh, for for new ways of teaching so why do they like uh, some skills and competences needed to to have well um I, i'll start uh, okay, <laughs> the, Antonio, the Initially, uh, the uh, Alfredo's question was initially directed at me, and, and yes. I'll, I'll give the floor to, to Mark then. Um, I, well, I have been talking for some for so long about this point that uh, possibly I just <laughs> it didn't worth it uh, now the the importance that it has. Um, uh, of course, teachers. Uh, we have been uh, putting students at center, uh, and this is, this is all right. I mean, it's still all right. Uh, but of course, teachers, as uh, it has been proven in, uh, during the pandemic, are a crit have a critical role, still have a critical role. Uh, someone in the ch chat talked about the importance of resilience. Well, if, if, any, if any, teachers have proven uh, the importance of resilience and how it is fundamental to uh, the sustainability of the of the education process and and, and the and the, the education um, systems as well. Uh, however, we we could we should look at this uh, from two perspectives. First of all, about digital competencies. Um, th there's a need, and, and the, the EU new action plan is is very um, rightly um, identifying this need. Uh, we need to reinforce uh, digital, not just on the digital capacity, but the level of digital competencies of our population. We now have a digital citizenship that has to be, um, um, in this sense, um, which people have to be educated for. And so this is not just a problem of, of, of teachers, it's a, a problem of society. Our students are not digital content as well. This is something that has been clear uh, during the pandemic. So we need to train the teachers. I mean, first of all, we need to educate teachers 
uh, in 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 um, developing their digital competencies clearly, but also regarding teacher training, which was more clearly the the point that Alfredo wanted to make. Um, I think that. What this crisis has also proven is the inadequacy of the teacher models, the teacher training models that have been used. They are completely obsolete if they are not putting teachers in the in an authentic context. So most of the people the, of the teachers have been trained. The ones that have been, received this, this training have been trained in face-to-face -face contexts. They were not prepared to interact in an online environment. They were not even prepared to use digital tools because they never used them in a proficient way. And they, besides that, they were not also aware of simple things as the importance of uh, silence in online communication, How, uh, the impact of, 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 of lurkers, uh, things as, that for us are so obvious for most of, the, uh, of our colleagues, the, it were not because they were never experienced such a such a, uh, a process. They didn't have the experience of being first online learners before being online teachers, and without that, it doesn't work. So uh, I would uh, re re um, respond to Alfredo, saying that I fully agree on the critical importance of teacher training, but on a new using a new model, a new approach that is digitally based. And in this sense, I would also, uh, well, share here something that uh, is a concern of mine and have been shared in also in other forums, which is teacher training as a whole needs to change. And digital teacher training should be at the mainstream of that um, of, of every teacher training program. So we, we should be training teachers for an, a high, an hybrid uh, environment and does it, that implies preparing them to work be, in in a fully online mode or a blended mode or um, uh, technology in, in, in enhanced mode, whatever. But the digital um, um, capacity, uh, digital, uh, digital teacher training in this sense, should be at uh, at the very center. Mark. <laughs> Yes, Mark, uh, your turn, but uh, to reflect on what Antonio said, and I'll just add something to, to make it more spicy. Digital transformation is not completely new. We had it for a number of years already. Technology is also present where why training is not already shaped in a new way so that we have skilled teachers. Mm, okay, um, let me pick up on Alfredo's uh, question first. Uh, I, I don't think we do prepare teachers well for online education or for transformation, but I think we need to be clear as to what we mean by transformation. Uh, it's one thing to prepare teachers to take what they already do and facilitate it online using the likes of uh, Zoom or something like that. Uh, it's another thing, again, to rethink the education system and teachers' preparedness for that. Um, just to give you an example, at Open Polytechnic, we are moving towards what we call 365 uh, which will enable any student to um, start any course at any time and also work flexibly at their own pace. Now, that's a real transformation in my view, uh, a much bigger transformation than taking what you currently do in a classroom and facilitating it through Zoom. Now, there's, there's a whole lot of context around that transformation at Open Polytechnic, which I don't have time to go into. Um, but I think one thing we could do to prepare teachers uh, for a transformed world is to encourage them to start thinking about their role uh, as part of a team. Uh, I'm yet to meet a teacher who's a very good learning designer, um, a very good researcher, and also a very good authority in their own um, subject area. Uh, I think uh, as we consider transformation and how university education might change, we need to think more about the ecosystem of teaching and the teacher's role in that ecosystem. So I think that's where, um, that's where I would take the, the question of preparation for teachers. I think it needs to be more than just extending what they do into the online space. I think we need to rethink entirely what it means to educate online, uh, to transform our education systems so that we can be really student-centered. Any course, any time should not be um, outrageous for us to think about. Uh, other parts of how the world operates um, already happen that way. And it's very possible to maintain the quality of education that we currently enjoy uh, under 
six five environments so my, my thinking is a lot more than um, how we can take what we currently do and digitally transform it i'm thinking there's much more that's possible uh, that, that we don't get near because we tend to be constrained by how universities currently operate uh, i also agree too that teachers have the key for transformation i think they're a very important part of what a transformation might look like um, but teachers work within an educational system and I think that system needs to be transformed before we see any real gain uh, in how education operates digitally. Well, Sandra, if I may just uh, add something. Uh, that is uh, why it is so important, in my view, to um, reconnect research with practice. Uh, and this is the, possibly one of the um, biggest dangers that uh, the emergency remote teaching and learning experience has. Um, may, ha may, may have it's the to create to generate this idea that, that the, I mean it, you, you just experiment and see what happens uh, um, it, it, no it, it doesn't happen that way so uh, this connection between um, research based um, research validating in a sense uh, knowledge and, ex and expertise it's really important but it's also important and this is a, a, a something that uh, should be addressed by digital transformation to um, focus on the transfer of knowledge and innovation from research to practice, to actual practice. Uh, and of course, that, uh, should, uh, that should be a part of the digital transformation process. As Mark has also uh, pointed out, the, um, the teacher profession and the teacher methodology uh, is, is also, should also be subject uh, to, uh, of that um, digital transformation. I mean, the, the models have already been designed in most cases. There is sufficient expertise on this, but it, it hasn't. It is not reaching the the, the, the practitioners, um, and it's not just because of lack of information. Information is available. It's because it's also uh, because of lack of involvement from the leadership, institutional leadership, in. Um, uh, caring for this connection. Okay, uh, let's have another question. Uh, Tim is saying, uh, there's a thing I like, vote with your feet. In our case, when students start to walk away from some higher education institutions to other who offer more flexible and stackable offerings, then change will be forced if survival is desired. Do you agree on, on that? Who will answer the, that one? I can probably go first. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Well, um, I agree too. Uh, although um, we should also uh, be uh, cautious about this because um, students don't think about uh, education in the same way that we think. So what we think is uh, very innovative, very advanced, very effective, may not be the same, uh, the same for them. And sometimes they just want to complete the process, have their remarks, and get get on with it. So, uh, but I I agree that uh, for, on a broader perspective, um, they they this choice will be fundamental for pushing institutions moving forward uh, regarding this investment. But in this sense, uh, um, I think that the the question is a little bit even more uh, wide, even wider, in the sense that um, higher education institutions are already starting to compete with non-formal education institutions, and and, and so this is a, a new a new territory that uh, might speed up this transformation as well. Actually, just, just to add to my response, uh, I'm assuming that um, Tim is um, saying that in the context of existing quality standards and existing um, outcomes in terms of a, a degree is still a degree, a graduate from a master's program is a graduate from a master's program. So no compromise on quality or anything like that. The educational quality should still be the same. Good. The next question is from Denise. Uh, she says, which... The uh, disruptor is on the horizon to change the status quo in the universities. Uh, if pandemic didn't uh, make them uh, changes, uh, what else uh, can be uh, on horizon uh, to, to 
to maybe to start to shift uh, uh, the possible changes. So, uh, Antonio, we would like to start. Okay. I can start on that one. Um, I do think that the next uh, battle will be uh, the, um, the, in this sense, the dissemination of uh, the uh, of use of artificial intelligence in, in education, and especially in higher education. So these, uh, um, in some way, we have already seen uh, in the pan in, during the pandemic um, how um, well uh, how uh, institutions were totally unprepared, and not just institutions, all the stakeholders were unprepared to 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 cope with the uh, amount of data that was generated and how that data was retrieved and will be used or is being used. Um, that it has already been uh, clear that, um, and, and not much has been talked about this, but this is probably one of the, one of the consequences with the higher impact in our field. Um, I, I would say that clearly uh, in the next few years, uh, the, the impact of the, this, well, disseminated use of uh, higher artificial intelligence uh, well, and well, I would even say Internet of Things and uh, all of this uh, will 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 clearly be um, uh, a driver for that for that uh, change and that transformation. Okay, Mark, you would like to add? Yes, I think there's actually an inevitability uh, toward more flexibility in education. Um, I think learner expectations are only going one way, and that is towards their own convenience. Uh, I, I think eventually the disruptor on the horizon will be just sheer competitiveness and keeping up with the way things change over time. Uh, so I think eventually students will come to expect any time enrollment. Um, I, I've worked in places where students might have to wait three to four months before starting the course of their choice. I think in the 21st century, that's going to become less and less acceptable to students where more flexible options are available. So I suspect over time um, that the disruptor will really prove to be the student expectations. Um, I think to, to how to change the status quo in universities, we are in institutions and in a, um, a context where there's significant inertia. Uh, that there's a lot of reason why change won't happen because of the way things are done, because of the way systems are designed. In New Zealand, for example, um, students are funded based on 120 credits worth of learning in a year. There's no reason why that should still be a constraint, but the system is such that um, students are only funded for 120 credits worth of tuition. So it means that in New Zealand, at least, um, education is incentivized almost to have a semesterized approach to provision. Now, th th there's that sort of... Um, inertia I think that we all work within that will make uh, change transformation difficult but the disruptor will eventually be student expectation well so if I just yeah. may uh, add something um, that I was reflecting upon I was just seeing um, some of the of the contributions in the chat um, uh, Mark uh, a while ago talked about what, uh, what was the his definition of education, the importance of getting back to basics and see what is education all about. Uh, for me, um, at, at the very foundation of the idea of education and the tradition of education is building uh, one's autonomy. Autonomy is at the center of every uh, notion of education. And what these new technologies that we're talking about, digital technology that we're talking about, uh, enhance is this possibility of improving that uh, autonomy building process. Uh, and I think that the pandemic has also accelerated that, uh, the, um, that trend. And so in that sense, I think that uh, people are much more aware of the importance of uh, uh, their educational process being closer to their authentic context and actually be effective to build their own autonomy more effective in building their own autonomy. And so in that sense, um, it might uh, be uh, also an important driver, this, this notion, which is, it's not, uh, I mean, usually not addressed in, in this kind of uh, uh, keynotes and the, all of this, but this is probably at the center um, 
And digital transformation is also um, um, pushing us to reflect again on the foundations of education, on the basics of, of the process, uh, and what is actually um, the value proposition, if you want to use a, <laughs> a more uh, a kind of a different um, language, uh, a different terminology. Um, so this might also uh, be important. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the next question. Um, um, looking at the uh, digital transformation in education on a global level, uh, definitely we, have, we see differences in, in what's going in Europe, in New Zealand, in America, in India. Uh, so uh, in, in your uh, uh, perspective, why there are some such diversities that some countries are quite ahead and some are still uh, uh, lacking behind. And uh, does uh, the digital transformation of education is an isolated um, process within the institution or the uh, impact of the environment and the culture is uh, uh, very uh, uh, important in that process? So who would like to, to go first? Mm. I can perhaps make some brief comments. Okay. Uh, I think every education, Every country does have its own education system, its own legislation, its own ways of funding education. So I, I think in, in many ways, the sorts of transformation we would expect to see should reflect those incentives. Uh, so a, a lot of behavior of universities and institutions is driven by the conditions that their funders place upon them. So again, my, my, um, my constant message is, are those systems, are those mechanisms in place, are those incentives the right ones? in order to uh, encourage us to be transformative in our thinking and practice. And I, I think in many cases, the answer is probably no, uh, that the systems and, pro and systems and funding processes tend to reinforce the current ways of doing things. So I, I think that would be my response. Um, sorry, Sandra, not much more to add there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Antonia? Well, um, there are a lot of differences, but there are also similarities, and we have seen them during the pandemic. Uh, um, if, if you look at how, for instance, national governments uh, conducted during the pandemic, uh, there are much more similarities than differences. And, and why? Because they were confronted uh, at the same time with uh, uh, more or less a similar challenge for, for each for which they were not prepared. And so they um, clearly started uh, learning from each other. Uh, and this is something that has happened at governmental level, at teacher level, uh, uh, all the other levels <laughs> in the education sector, uh, even families. I mean, we had uh, parents uh, um, registering for webinars on uh, how you teach online and things like that, which is really remarkable. That a lot of very important, interesting um, new things happened uh, in the, I mean, during the pandemic and because of the pandemic uh, that will be, uh, will reflect positively uh, in how education, the education sector will evolve. But you address the problem of uh, differences. Um, I think that in Europe, uh, there's a clear difference, which is the um, role of the European Commission. Sometimes it might be a kind of a, a break to change. Some of the times uh, it, it will uh, be a driver for that change. Well, I'm talking about positive change in, in a sense, because change can also be negative. I mean, you can change for worse. <laughs> There's also that possibility. And change is not always positive, uh, even if in the end the process is a, is a good one. So there are all, always um, problems, there are also constraints, there are also difficulties, there are also risks. Well, uh, it's not all, all just a, 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 a kind of a Cinderella story. Um, anyway, the European Commission clearly plays a very important role uh, in, in the also assuring that, at least in, in Europe, uh, most of the national government, uh, how they act, also the national re regulations, the uh, legislations and regulations, these frameworks uh, that Mark was talking about, uh, funding schemes and all of these are much more, uh, are very similar in a sense, are much compatible. And this generates uh, also a larger amount of ex exchange of experience and also uh, 
inspira- shared inspiration in a sense. Um, there are the regions in which it doesn't happen in some way. For example, just a, 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 a good example, in Latin America, uh, the difference between national governments is much more clear than in Europe. Um, they have very different uh, approaches. Also, reality is much more different uh, and diverse than in Europe. This is an example we could use other regions of the world as well. So uh, change and these transformation processes will not uh, happen at the same time. They will not happen at the same pace. They will not happen with the same conditions. But as we've seen in the, in, during the pandemic, everyone will uh, start doing something, not exactly the same, with the same resources, with the, following the same uh, solutions, but they will be uh, sharing a same, a similar route in a sense, or the same route in a sense. So um, this is also something that we have to take into consideration. This uh, transformation of higher education, maybe this digital transformation, uh, may have a different um, a different models, different facets, uh, dif- di- uh, according to which region. Uh, Mark also um, pointed out something which, for me, it's 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 very important, which is funding. Uh, I mean, in order to change, you need funding. I mean, it facilitates change. It's not uh, an absolute need. You can change even if you're not funded for it. I'm talking about institutional change, but it's much much easier and much more quicker to do it with with the right funding. And so uh, it involves also uh, national and regional authorities, uh, institutional leadership, the actors in the field, and the practitioners in the sense. So everyone should be, uh, in, in a way, articulating. Uh, I mean, articulated in their in their action, uh, integrated in the, in the same um, strategic move. Um, but um, it's it, there's bound to be change. And I'll give you an example. I mean, for us in Europe, inter, uh, internet access is very much based on the the um, cable infrastructure. In regions as, as Africa, is based on mobile infrastructure, uh, but it's the same. <laughs> However, uh, the the way it is organized and should be uh, well, in a way, driven, is different. Uh, this is the kind of differences that we should also take into consideration. Hmm. Actually, if I could just add one more thing. Yes. So it's very remiss of me to not mention in New Zealand the current reform uh, of vocational education. So the Minister of Education has launched a, a fresh look at the vocational education sector in New Zealand and legislation is being changed. Uh, so we are having to transform as a sector. There are currently 16 polytechnics in New Zealand. As of the 1st of January 2023, there will be one. So there's a lot of transformative possibility there, which is actually very genuine. We do need to rethink how vocational education is offered in New Zealand. And it is leading to some very innovative thinking and I think to some uh, innovative practice as the whole system changes and is redesigned. But Sandra, if I may, there's also another important thing that we should, should take into consideration. Uh, these digital transformation of, uh, of education institutions will um, speed up their internationalization. And what happens is that your institution will be operating in different regions, with, uh, which are um, ruled by different regulations, different uh, um, well funding f- uh, f- uh, uh, frameworks, and all of this. So this is so, so uh, the scenario for institutions is also changing. And in, in this sense, it's becoming more complex and uh, um, m- multiplied by, in this sense, by different uh, approaches and frameworks. Okay, we are come, we are over an hour now. Uh, we have to start, uh, it has passed so quickly. I, I have numerous question in the head and I'm certain, uh, certain the participants as well, as well. but. Uh, the last question uh, to, to summarize uh, uh, in the end um, would be, uh, is uh, a technology effectively changing education or not? But from the perspective of the researchers, researches we have been collecting over a year and a half, 
which have been which have been significant number of research, you know. So how would these researchers, um, as as you have if certainly you have been following the research before, but they were much more technically oriented than pedagogically oriented regarding the implementation of technologies. So uh, do we have with these research results now good ideas uh, and good knowledge to implement that technology is more effectively change education than before, or if technology didn't change education at all, what would be your point uh, there? Uh, so, if, if I can go first, I, I think okay. my point would be there is a lot of research on education. There's a lot of research on technology. There's a lot of research on technology-enhanced education. I think the missing element is really a, a critique of the systems in which we operate as universities and as educators, because I think that's really where the um, inertia for change, the inertia for transformation really rests. So I don't think there's been enough work critiquing the systems in which we operate. So I'm not sure if the research has actually been adequately done yet. Well, uh, if, if you think back of what would be a typical uh, uh, research paper on on on, on digital education, uh, some few, well twenty years ago, the typical article would be uh, um, a study comparing um, a, a class, an online class, <laughs> with a, with a traditional face to face one, and see what worked best. This was a typical <laughs> article uh, back then. Uh, Nobody is doing it, or I mean, very few people were doing it uh, before the pandemic. And during, uh, we, because of the pandemic, this sort of a, uh, kind of a first approach uh, was re, 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 reinitiated uh, once again. But um, the learning curve has been quite, um, quite um, dramatic in this sense. And I think that we had a, a tremendous um, massive learning experience in the field. And uh, that has reflected on research as well. For six months, one year, we had a tremendous amount of new research conducted by new researchers in the field as well on the on how technology was being used in education because of the pandemic or due to the pandemic uh, context. Now we are starting to see that output transforming as well uh, into more um, a, a more qualitative approach. What works best? What has been uh, the lessons learned? Uh, what could be improved? Uh, well, this sort of of uh, of, um, of questioning. Uh, but the pandemic has then that uh, has had that consequence. It widened dramatically the number of practitioners, but it is also widening the number of researchers on our topics, which means that um, these research sometimes, I mean, at first. Uh, looks a, a little bit as old in the sense that while well, they're trying to reinvent the wheel, they do not have, um, in a way, the right uh, knowledge regarding tradition, the legacy of the field. And so they are, well, starting as, as if we're just uh, <laughs> initiating it now. But um, the, we should also be uh, looking at what are the new topics that have been um, addressed, what are the new um, uh, innovations that have been also identified, and what is the new, the new contributions that are uh, being received as well. And if we look at it closer, um, it, it, the, this production is, is rather rich. There's a lot of important and valuable things. And what we can conclude as well is that the amount of research uh, is much higher now than it was two years ago. And from that increase in quantity, it's bound to happen also an increase in quality. And so an, uh, a higher number of researchers, um, a wider uh, number of, uh, a, wider, a wider community of research in this sense is, is also bound to produce uh, scaling up in the quality and the impact of the research in our field. And I think this is uh, very important for us to, uh, to be looking at. It's, it, it will bring also change to, to open distance and digital learning in this sense, 
learning field uh, will um, empower the field, will uh, also increase the quality of, of, of what is being done. And, and this is something that is critical. I mean, uh, the widening of, the, uh, of, of uh, pra practice has, of course, decreased the, the, the quality level. But now it will come back again. Uh, but it will come back uh, to, well, probably the similar quality levels that they had already in the field of practice, but with an increased outreach and, and uh, an increased field as well. Um, I think this is uh, very significant and we, well, uh, it's a, a very good consequence uh, of, of the crisis, uh, the pandemic crisis. Nevertheless, I think we all also uh, should uh, be um, should be paying attention to uh, some changes that will necessarily occur. I think, for instance, one of the things that probably will affect uh, well the theory uh, is the fact that now the use of um, uh, synchronous communication and video, for instance, or video conferencing. Um, will probably be um, higher in the future than before. We have to look at it more carefully. Uh, we have to also try to rebalance that uh, with uh, um, um, a new importance given to asynchronous communication uh, and the, 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 the ways in which we can rebuild this uh, possibility for reflection, deeper learning, um, that that would, in a way, improve the quality uh, of this experience. But I, I, I'm well. To 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 sum up, um, I'm positive about this. I'm optimistic. Uh, uh, I'm not a fool, so I know that there are dangers, of course. Um, but um, uh, if looking back at what happened in just well over uh, one and a half year, I think that the impact has been uh, tremendous. We're still recovering from it. Uh, we still don't know exactly what happened. We don't have a perfect picture of what uh, this represented to our field, but we can already see, we have already evidences that it uh, changed it dramatically, uh, but as a, as a driving for, um, for uh, quantity and quality in this sense. Sorry, uh, thank you. Uh, I know that Tim will be angry with me, but I have just one small question, Tim. Well, can I can I have two more minutes, please? Uh, so, uh, last, uh, I would like to ask from you uh, what will be your message? What is the perspective of digital transformation in higher education? So, you have one minute each, please. So, Mark, maybe you can start. Okay, I think we need to think bigger. Um, I think we need to consider again what education might look like if we were able to start again now with what technology is capable of. Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic too, actually, about um, how we are using technology at the moment. I don't think anyone wants to make education less accessible, less scalable, less personalized. Uh, I think that we do need to take a careful look at the systems and models that we are a part of because they are the insidious elements here that do constrain us from being all uh, the, the transformative educators that we can be. Hopefully uh, that's within my minute. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great. Antonio, your, what, your one minute, but one <laughs> minute only. <laughs> yes. Well, I think it will, um, well, to be very brief, uh, 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 all things considering, I think that the digital transformation of uh, higher education, which was, was the topic, will improve the quality of, uh, of uh, higher education, uh, making it uh, more access. I mean, more accessible tool or for a, a higher number of uh, of people. So, in the sense that it will uh, make it more accessible, more um, personalized in a sense as well, more appropriate to which one's needs, uh, more dependent on on the learner's control as well. Uh, and in that sense, I think. It summing up, it will uh, enhance the building of, of autonomy that is at the core of the educational process. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Antonio. Very interesting discussion, very 
uh, thought-provoking insights and things uh, to think about over uh, what we can do ourselves uh, to make things better. Thank you again for being the keynotes uh, uh, in this Eden uh, session. Uh, over to you, Tim. So please, now you can take your time. Uh, I'll, I'll step uh, out. Thank you very much, Sandra. And thank you, Antonio, Mark. You, I think you've really left us with, uh, with a wonderfully constructive and uh, high uh, end, of the, end of the conference. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to uh, now pass over to our conference uh, rapporteurs. Um, Copadonga Rodrigo, the, the chair of the Digital Inclusion Lab at UNED in Spain. And Mark Brown, the director of, of the National Institute for Digital Learning at, uh, at DCU in Ireland. And uh, please make yourself comfortable because I, I suspect that Mark might have a filibuster prepared for us. Okay, so I have to admit that at first I was um, a bit overwhelmed uh, with uh, the grave responsibility of, of this mission. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, I, I try to be as transparent and accurate as possible. But, um, you know, I was just uh, stuck by the uh, fact that I could not uh, duplicate myself and the, the Zoom um, uh, technology didn't allow me to participate in, in parallel sessions. So anyhow, uh, thanks for, for the aid of all our colleagues from UNED that were, you know, as, uh, acting as technicians uh, in the backwards. And so I, started to um, listen, you know, to as much of your interventions as, as, as I could. Uh, so um, just trying, uh, sorry, doing my uh, brainstorming, um, I was uh, confused with the term uh, rapporteur. So I just started to do some self-based online training, like uh, voice imitation. And, and I, I started to, to play with the Google Translator and the uh, the different accents, you know, the French accent for the rapporteur and, and the uh, the English version. So, okay, uh, Tim, I think that the French one is much more uh, fashion and, and, and nicer. So I will take that. And then uh, for, for the narrative, uh, I had the chance of listening to um, Manolo Castro, and then uh, he flipped everything uh, around and on the and, and his keynote. So I, I thought to myself, okay, I, I just try to, to do my best, and, and I think I have uh, I messed everything up. So starting from uh, today's opening session, um, Ulf, I was there too uh, with you with my espresso. Um, okay, here uh, there is the, the, um, the cloud of the words that were mentioned by, by all the participants there. And, and it was uh, very important, you know, to, uh, to highlight uh, all the meaning of, of this uh, sense of community and also uh, the idea of, of being the authority for, for uh, fostering uh, the rest of, of, of the stakeholders in, in, in this environment. So uh, the sense of legacy, uh, act as incubators for, for, for new uh, institutions. So it was very important. And, you know, I think uh, even though it was uh, this morning, so I, I think it was uh, uh, the first idea I wanted to, to share with you all this opportunity knocks that, that we listened uh, from this uh, morning. So uh, thinking on the, on, on the ideas that were brought uh, from different people, um, uh, Joao uh, highlighted that the pandemic helped us to overcome the prejudices of distance education. And, and, and Christian addressed that we are in an strategic moment. And he recalled this hybridism, this uh, possible of um, developing uh, regulated learning in knowledge networks that I, I could select like the quote for, for day one. So um, there is a high potential, uh, you know, for complementary uh, le learning theories. And again, this idea of cooperation of wide range of experts that may produce new combined forms of education was uh, on the floor. Um, again, um, the, the idea of the, uh, uh, how, how these new uh, means or, or ways like we, we've uh, heard about blended before. Now, uh, as Antonio mentioned, we are moving into hybrid and all ki other kinds of, uh, of mi mixtures. So diversity, equity, and inclusion were, you know, uh, very uh, key uh, points in, in our uh, work. So uh, if we develop it well, 
online hybrid education could be much more inclusive and we could address all these uh, three uh, main points. And uh, there is also an important issue on um, democratization and the openness and, and inclusion features for the future are based on the transformative power of open data, as Branka mentioned. And then um, also the, um, the consideration of uh, diverse needs uh, that uh, were said by uh, we, including accessibility aspects and all the backgrounds of all the students uh, that we think uh, that we uh, help to create uh, an online and face-to-face -face experiences where all the students could feel more valued, safe, and, and also have a sense of belonging. Um, Okay, um, today we also um, get a deep look on this digital media literacy and the problems, uh, the teachers' workload and how, how they feel. It's true that uh, it's uh, quite different, the view from the teachers and the view from the students. So um, we are very perfectionist and, and I'm sure that we try to do our best, but, you know, not always the context that help us to do that. So. Um, you know, um, it could be uh, uh, an important workload for the teacher with a negative impact or some cognitive overload or the, the sense of the quality of the learning and teaching and, and also the very limited methods that, that could be applied. So I liked uh, the Elena's idea of, of uh, remind, uh, that she reminded us that the tools of our era, the digital tools, how we should all be digitalized and in today's Mark Nichols um, mentioned about um, you know the humanistic approach that we have to recover and, and after you know uh, we are educated we think different so we have to go back to this humanistic and approach and and, and and try to make you know all this uh, this uh, mixture between the technology and and, and the uh, methodologies so um I like the, the challenge of, of uh, Diane uh, put the eye on the uh, on the uh, STEM um, uh, education and, and this uh, project project based learning and other methodologies. But um, there are some issues regarding the quality evaluation and accreditation of these kinds of uh, methods and and and, and courses. And um, I really loved the, the presentation from Diana uh, Loriard and, and where uh, she showed us, you know, how to uh, collaborate uh, to innovate and, and share our in innovations and our design pedagogies. If we work uh, collaboratively, how we could change uh, the attitudes and uh, expand our horizons. Um, we also had some... Um, uh, facts that were rather weird. Um, thinking on this uh, newly video-based uh, campus, um, okay, um, yeah, we, we, we already knew that, uh, that the videos should be uh, not too long, but um, okay, students want us to just uh, look uh, different, no? rather like a crazy researcher. So I'm sure that uh, I should go to my hairdresser, you know, and for next time and, and, and make myself uh, different. So, okay, there is a, a, an enormous um, uh, place here, you know, for, for, for many, many things to do. Uh, the role of this self-directed learning is also there. And, and there were also some facts, uh, you know, uh, that struck me, like, like uh, the way uh, the women or, or men, how, how we watch the videos and, or how we read the, the texts. And, and the neuroscientific approaches, you know, for for explaining all that. So uh, as today uh, Benoit Donet, uh, uh, said, um, not all the students want to do this self-directing learning. And um, some of them, they just follow, you know, task uh, uh, and like a, a learning, you know, with the with, uh, with a task delivery in 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 a, in a very uh, with with a very stri uh, strict uh, agenda. Uh, regarding the assessment, uh, it was um, um, an important uh, point in in many uh, parallel sessions. Um, is uh, it ought to be uh, among one of the most challenging parts of the online education. Um, 
uh, also during the pandemic. And, um, and, and most of the teachers, they see that online assessments are, are very time consuming activity. Uh, they feel that they don't have enough time or competences to prepare proper tests or even to provide valid and objective feedback to the students. And, um, and on the other side, we have the students' view where they are uh, worried about the technology, the skills, the re reliability of the software. And also they are um, uh, aware that they, 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 um, they, they are concerned about the confidence in the provider and also about the privacy issues when they are recorded. So uh, as Alistair uh, Creelman uh, pointed out, it's the main problem is not that we are, uh, um, the main problem is that we are unable to quantify or assess uh, deep learning and, and success nowadays is determined by rather superficial assessment methods. And Ulf also, Ulf, Ulf Daniels also, uh, mentioned this uh, this point, and, and he uh, says that we will have multimodal assessments, and we need a, um, an integrated concept of knowledge and competences, uh, you know, for for achieve that. Um, and regarding the data, uh, for sure, uh, the privacy is critical. Uh, it is not seen uh, in the same sense in all over the world. In, in Europe, we have this GDPR uh, regulation that, uh, you know, is, is uh, on top of us. So it's, we have to think on this uh, privacy by design or ethics by design tools. And uh, there is a lot of concern about some other ch uh, challenges from the, um, the uh, integration of um, of artificial intelligence based tools such as the biases that could uh, appear in the uh, within the algorithms so it's a, it's a critical uh, issue and um, and mohammad uh, khalid uh, pointed out that um, that data is available like uh, never before so uh, we might have a lot of data to uh, develop more precise learning analytics and uh, you know, help also not only the academics, but also the decision makers. So I like this um, quote for day two, like predictable analytics can bring people with the same objectives uh, together. Um, I think that, um, that uh, the institutions that we are um, together in this uh, uh, conference here, uh, we have the data, we have the data from um, previous to the pandemic situation. So. We are the best ones to 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 build um, analytics on that and, and set up some strategies for other stakeholders. So um, I loved uh, when when Christian reminded us this uh, Chinese proverb: "Where the winds of change blow, some build walls while others build windmills." So I thought we should uh, build the windmills, and education is moving with or without us. And, and we have to put the eye on the sustainable development goals and also the evidences uh, for quality. And then just, just finishing, um, I, I guess that there are a lot of, I see a lot of uh, um, future, great future for the education marketplace. Um, there are a lot of uh, professions for, for the teacher education. I loved uh, when Manol, Manolo Castro I should the teachers are the bus drivers of the education, and then Sandra um, uh, remarked, "Okay, but the robots are the content drivers, but the teachers are the drivers of the robots." So uh, I see that there could be other um, professionals uh, coming in, like regulators or supervisors for the proctoring exams, and uh, there is a lot of work to for policymakers. Um, there is a need for coordinators of the uh, learning designer teams and, and developers uh, really focused on the privacy by uh, design methods. Uh, we might need some ethics evaluators or uh, some um, extra new, um, uh, new um, technicians for, for developing, uh, engaging resources and multimedia and, and podcasters and so on. And um, we might uh, need some conductors for, for the new uh, standards for lab at home and might also need some blockchain miners uh, for, for ed educator education uh, credentials. And I'm sure that uh, I will apply for a digital twin uh, 
for next even the rapporteur next year. So when you think that uh, we have um, listened to everything, that we have learned everything, here comes Francesc Pedro and, 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 and talks us about the, the yogurt dilemma. So um, when thinking about the duration and synchronicity of uh, the current degree programs, um, there is a need of, you know, to use more agile innovation methods and uh, the consumption rate. And we should just stop with the traditional ideas. And, and, and as it was mentioned this morning by Irina, uh, today's world requires continuous education, lifelong, uh, starting from, from the very first day of, of our lives. So to finish, I just... Um, make a, a screen capture of today's stories that were posted uh, in our uh, uh, breakfast. So um, I, I loved the, the quote for today is uh, Antonio's and uh, as it uh, said, it's uh, fun being a member of Eden. So uh, thanks a lot for listening to me and I hope you the best, I wish you the best and hope uh, to see you next year on this uh, Eden's uh, family. Thank you very much, Kova. That was very interesting, very entertaining and, and full of information. Mark? Well, that's a hard act to, to follow, to be honest. Um, I'll do my best um, and to complement um, what we've heard. Uh, I'm going to start off um, just reflecting for a minute that it is 30 years. Um, 1991 was when Eden was formed. Alan gave us a, an interesting history lesson this morning, very early. And I, I'm calling these um, some reflections because it's impossible to get an overview of the entire conference. But what I will say is it's been easier to dab in and out of sessions virtually than it would be if I was doing this physically. So that's one advantage. Um, I want to begin by saying that 1991 is known as being a year that changed the world. And um, it's the year that Freddie Mercury died of AIDS. Um, and I think, hadn't we come a long way in a more inclusive society, at least in many parts of the world? And one would like to think that education has contributed to that. Um, that didn't happen by chance. So um, an anchoring point to begin with. But 1991 was significant because in Europe, that was the period where there were major changes, regional, structural, political, geopolitical changes, and I won't linger on those. Many of you lived through that period. Um, but perhaps even more important, some could argue with the benefit of hindsight, is 1991 is the year that the web was open to the public. I can't imagine what it was like when I was working in a university in 1991 anymore to the extent with which the web has changed. Maybe I could say transformed, depends how we define transformed, but how in 30 years that technology has had such an impact on our lives both in our personal lives, but our professional lives. I think in almost every single walk of um, certainly developed um, societies. And then um, 2021, I think might be known in the future as another one of those years that changed the world. Maybe it's 2020, but more positively, this is the year where we are getting on top of the pandemic. And, and I have the... Um, the needle there, apologies for people who are not taped to needles, but balancing viewing all of the presentations that I could, I also had to slip away for a, my own jab. Uh, and I was hoping that I didn't have any issues as a consequence. So that's a framing point of reference. And all I'm going to do is talk you through my journey through the conference very quickly. And this is going to be the quickest slideshow you've probably seen in history. So we began with our um, obviously, um, two introductions, one year privileged to have the uh, Spanish um, Secretary for Education, previous rector for um, the university, the host university. So setting the scene with the context around COVID and changes around higher education. Already, we've heard about um, the big picture thinking in our very first keynote. And I'm teasing out three sort of takeaways for me, which I'll elaborate here um, on slides. 
the, the slow progress or uptake or what it is actually that we've taken up um, and note the PowerPoint, you know, PowerPoint wasn't something that was being used in 1991 like it is now. Um, whether that's transformation is quite debatable. Then um, I thought this was an excellent point that the focus on hybrid learning or hybridization is not new. It was happening well before the pandemic. Maybe that word is taking on more, uh, more definition in our thinking. And then lastly, my takeaway here was around sort of evidence that we do need to have a much better understanding of the cost benefit analysis. Wash my mouth out in Europe to use the word return on investment. What is it that we get an outcome from for all our efforts? And so I thought that was an excellent takeaway. Brilliantly connected by Diana to her thinking around learning design. Um, so I picked out three points I want to talk about here, but before I tease those out, I think it's also important to acknowledge that Diana is one of the rare people that's lived right through those 30 years and made a contribution, a significant, huge contribution right through. And her first book on Rethinking University came out in 1993. So Diana talked about um, needing to scale up, put us in the context of the reality. Did you know that there's a huge proportion of the population on the continent of Africa that are under the age of 15? And their need for higher education is enormous compared to some developed countries where actually their population growth is slowing or decreasing. So this growth for um, scaling up is variable across geography or demographic boundaries. Diana took us back to the conversational framework, a learner designer tool. Um, the quote already pulled out, collaborate to innovate. I have there. Only question I would have for, or a challenge for our community is how easily these tools really mesh in the everyday work of teachers. Um, do we really embed these and integrate them into our work? But really importantly, again, following on, um, the theme of cost and cost-benefit analysis, Diana asked us to think about what the return is on our efforts because we are all time poor. Um, and then when it came to the breakouts on the first day, um, I had a challenge, so I chose, I, I went to a couple, but I want to tease out the one in particular focusing on the student experience, the learner experience. Um, you can see from the word cloud here some of the focus points and then this one around workload really stood out for me. There's been a similar survey in Ireland showing this was a very large survey, I think of 12,000 learners worldwide, how much the COVID experience had increased workload, which took me to a slide that wasn't um, shared by any of the presenters, but I really was triggered to this from Diana's talk that we need workload calculators for students to calculate the learner experience, not just the time that the teacher spends. So this is an example of a learner calculator. And then I don't think many of us would disagree around the emotional aspects to learning. It's a particular area of interest that we have in the team. I'm, I'm, I'm less, I'm careful about talking about the pedagogy of care that's become popularized because that could easily be framed in a deficit way. And I think promoting autonomy and self-reliance is very important as well. Um, one of the great things I wanted to profile from that session was this podcast series of students talking about their learning experience. So if you haven't come across this, you didn't get to the session, great resource. Um, and it's a nice segue then to the second um, set of plenaries on day one. Booth um, really gave us a big picture overview, talking about futures, personas, and skills. What I really enjoyed in his playful keynote was the way that he didn't talk, talk about the future, he took us to the future. And then we looked back, um, so we were in the future. Um, so I really enjoyed that aspect. And then he gave us these personas. You, some of you may remember we began with Florence. Um, I think this is pronounced Niles. Um, and Niles was one who was looking for a lifelong learning experience that was much more personalized. And so if conceptualized the different futures around these four quadrants or different types, he then gave us a, a, a poll to see which one we would choose. Um, I chose the lifelong learning university, but that personalized university came through. 
And then he took us into um, the importance of skills. Now, skills is a theme that's been woven right through the um, conference. But in the context of skills, he did also talk about with the so-called transversal future skills, to his, use his language, of just the challenges of how we assess those and whether they can be assessed in some cases. That took us to the second plenary in the afternoon where Darcy gave a presentation. I want to tease out language quality and strategy. And um, I do think language matters here. I appreciate for many of you that we're talking um, a second language in the sense of English, but the terms really do matter. There's a, a great paper that I've just put on the slide, just published in the British Journal of Educational Technology, giving a theoretical definition of hybrid learning. These terms are not all the same. Um, and then we talked about quality. I've put, um, taken the liberty of putting a spray can there on the side. I sometimes think that word quality is sprayed around a bit like aerosol, you know, fly spray or deodorant. What does it really mean? Um, I'm not sure I can explain what it means, but I know what it is when you experience it. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't have to look good to be quality. Um, and then talking about strategy, I think there were some debates in the chat box from time to time about, do you really need a digital learning and teaching strategy or do you need a strategy for teaching and learning that infuses digital throughout? Um, because it could be seen as inherently technocentric to focus on the digital. In the afternoon, um, unfortunately, that's when I had to shoot out to go and get my jab, so I couldn't participate with my colleagues on the uh, micro-credential session, but I wanted to do at least the call out to them for thanking them to take that workshop and point you to the little white paper that we've produced that's now available in the Eden um, space and we'll share more publicly afterwards. Obviously one of the big areas, if you like. That moves us to day two, beginning with um, the commission and um, we heard here about the disruption um, consultation and then ultimately action from Gori. And um, you know, the disruption has been real, I think, is something we should acknowledge. Um, and in fact, perhaps I think uh, Antonio made this point in the stability of our institutions that we were successful. We didn't cave in. We, we actually did have the resilience to respond. Uh, the public consultation side, I think, is crucial because there's been a lot of talk about vision. Um, visions can be very blinding and visions need to be from the grassroots. People have to own visions. So I can't emphasize consultation enough. And there has to be space for people to have different visions, competing visions. And then lastly, action. There is a plan. The challenge will be whether that plan aligns with what's happening in member states. Uh, the education hubs we heard about are important. I'm personally involved in the research on the feasibility study for the um, digital education knowledge exchange. Um, so I think we've got some exciting opportunities and there is a plan, but um, the plan only goes so far. Moving on to the next keynote. I hope I'm okay on time. Cut me off, Tim, if I've taken too much liberty here. Um, I enjoyed the format, so I did want to call out um, the fact that we had a flipped keynote. Um, and again, we were looking at powerful change forces and the importance of redesigning. Um, so uh, working backwards in the keynote, I think, was a good model for how we don't always have to follow a formula here. Um, and then uh, a lot of what we're talking about in terms of transformation, rightly or wrongly, is anchored in so-called the fourth industrial revolution. And I do think we have to have a critical lens when we're being told that 65% of jobs of today won't exist in the future, because there is no solid empirical data to support that. But on the other hand, one would not argue that the changing nature of work isn't real. I think it is. And ultimately, the importance of redesign, and, and my quote for the day there was, the future is hybrid, um, and, and the need to rethink and move away from linear ways of thinking. Although that said, I'm giving you a very linear account of the conference. Moving to the afternoon sessions, again, it was a challenge to what I could dabble with. Um, I was actually chairing the C1 session. Uh, I had a paper in the D1 session that a colleague was presenting. So I tried to dabble and in the E4 digital education system, Oof and others were doing a, a workshop on a project that we're involved in. 
a big call out for my colleague uh, Orna and her um, colleagues from our institute for this free online book. It's actually being launched, I think, next Tuesday. If you haven't come across this, hopefully Orna can put the link in the chat box. Um, and then um, I did manage to get a little bit into the workshop on competencies. This is obviously a big theme. Um, and I thought it was interesting about um, the emphasis on thinking about where are the gaps, what is it that we, we haven't thought around. And I, I put in there, taken the sort of the liberty to put a quote from a piece I wrote last year about that if we want more creative, innovative and imaginative learners, ultimately those are the qualities we need to foster in our teachers. And I don't always see those qualities implicit or explicit in these competence frameworks. And then um, I wanted to just call out the workshop, um, partly because it's taking an ecological approach, a whole of ecosystem, and also the survey is open on OERs right now as part of the Encore project. Um, so if you haven't um, seen that survey, I would encourage you to take a look. Yes, it was an early start for me this morning, um, especially since I had a webinar that didn't finish until half past one last night. Um, the three words when our four ex-presidents couldn't follow the rules when they were told to give one word or one picture and they bent the rules but I'm inclined to do that myself but I took the three words opportunities um, communities and expertise um, for summing up the uh, dimensions and qualities that Eden has to offer um, Again, a challenge juggling the day job to manage um, some of the other sessions. I tried to pop in and out uh, from time to time, a bit of a call out for the digital culture project. Um, if you haven't seen this, there are a range of free courses that have been developed through this project. Um, and I'd encourage you to take a look. Diana is taking a lead role. And um, this particular one stood out in the synergy um, presentations. I couldn't share all of them. I know there's an Irish um, case study that will be part of it. So um, I'll be watching this one in particular because it follows on that theme around teacher competence and how we define that um, and how we promote it and foster it. So without any further ado, what I'm going to do is just give you my three sort of takeaways since I've given you three from each presenter. Um, mine, hybrid. Um, more of an ecosystem approach. The ecosystem very much focuses for me where that word resilience comes through. If you think of an ecology, actually, you know, backwaters and different habitats that have diversity are what add to resilience, the opportunity for a species to survive, to continue to evolve. But actually things happen quite slowly in, in an evolutionary um, ecosystem sense. What I have done with the third one is we heard a lot about lifelong learning, but I called it lifelong learner because I wanted to shift it to the learner. And we heard in this conference, and it's a big takeaway for me from the COVID experience, is much more understanding from the learner's perspective, hearing their voice, what it is and what it means to be a learner. Um, so that's partly why I just shifted that focus a little bit. Um, if you're smart, you will have found that hybrid ecosystem and lifelong learning as an acronym make hell. Um, that wasn't intentional. Um, some might say we've gone through hell, um, but we wouldn't want to be heading towards hell, would we not? So I wanted to finish on a positive note to say that hello is in the word hell and good is in goodbye, um, and so on and so forth. So hopefully no one takes exception with the acronym of HAL. And my final um, slide, I think, if I've still got time, is in terms of the Eden community, I like this, um, whether it's an African proverb or not, someone can correct me at some point. But if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And our communities are really, really powerful. And this conference would not be possible without all the people behind the community. And apologies for that canned applause, but I did want to call out Tim and his role in particular, obviously all of the people involved. And you have a shot there, a small photo of the Eden team in Budapest who have kept everything running behind the scenes. So a big thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to share my insights, which I hope have been helpful. Tim, you have to unmute the mic. 
Thank Thank you. I, I had done so, but it had suddenly become muted again. No, I was just saying, literally, in this case, not metaphorically, that I was speechless. I think you've done an amazing job, and um, I really uh, think you've done a, a fantastic job, and it really shows the amount of time and, and effort you've put into this process. Thank you very much indeed. It really was, uh, was very good, and I think it reflects what's been a really uh, interesting and, and fulfilling uh, uh, conference. And just before I pass over to, to Sandra for the final uh, farewell and uh, closing words, I'd also like to make some uh, my, my personal thanks here. I mean, firstly, to all of you for actually being here and having uh, participated so much in the conference, to all of our speakers uh, in all the different kinds of sessions, um, for everyone involved in the PhD symposium, the scientific uh, program committee members for the paper reviews, and also the, the, the supporters, moderators, etc. Um, Dooley, Murek um, Benath, and the awards panel. Uh, specific thanks for the technical support from, from UNED. You guys have been there all, uh, all hours of the day and, and the night, and thank you very much indeed. To our two conference rapporteurs, Kova and Mark, and especially to my uh, conference coordinator, Beatrice Serrano. I don't think she slept at all over the last uh, few days, and uh, I hope you're not going to pass me too big a bill for therapy after, after this conference is over. And I think, as, uh, as Mark said, I mean, to the secretary, I think without whom we, we really wouldn't have uh, a conference. And my final comment, I think, is that um, I've got this really strong, strong feeling of deja vu, because this is the second year on a, on a row that I've actually been in the conference um, session online, sat at home in front of the computer. And I really hope that as the Eden family, next year we can be together face to face and, uh, and enjoy each other's comments as well as uh, company, as well as our um, the stimulating in academic uh, interchange. So that's all from me. Thank you very much indeed. And over to Sandra now. Thank you, Tim. You all said all the greetings already. As Mark said, we had living hell from all three, four days, <laughs> but we enjoyed it. Definitely enjoyed it. Uh, lots of things, uh, very fruitful, creative uh, ideas, thoughts, uh, expertise that has been shown, researchers uh, and research that we have seen. And just let me uh, at the end, share my uh, share my, my the presentation, which was presented uh, prepared for me by the uh, by the secretariat. I they're always on uh, on help uh, for everything, so uh, I don't want to take credit for this presentation. Just let me summarize uh, briefly. So we are uh, closing one more Eden conference, Eden 2021 virtual annual conference which was held from June 21st to 24th and was hosted by UNED. Virtually, we were in Madrid, but uh, in reality, sitting in our chairs. Uh, this year, we are celebrating three decades of serving modernization in education in Europe, Eden 30th anniversary. You have heard this morning about the beginning uh, when Alan Tate shared the photo and some stories uh, from the past. Uh, definitely, we are organization, we are association looking toward the futures and to all the challenges we will encompass on this way. So I'm certain that the next 30 years uh, is ahead of us uh, with very fruitful and uh, creative uh, perspectives. In the numbers, annual conference, 395 particip participants from 57 countries, uh, really impressive numbers. We have over 50 papers, 13 workshops, and quite another uh, big number of other sessions and contributions. I think this is really, really good. I wish to thank all our keynote speakers. Uh, I, have, I have to say that these were really, really good keynotes. All of them, you cannot uh, say one was better than the other because each of them provided valuable insight and uh, information which we can use in our work and enable uh, us to move forward and make some uh, adaptation in our way we think and work. We had Eden uh, student, PhD student symposium this year. It was on the first day and I'm very happy that it was successful uh, and this is something which is now becoming like a sort of the brand of Eden uh, where we 
try to work with young PH with young with PhD students uh, and help them uh, to uh, get the the best uh, out of uh, what they are doing by sharing the knowledge and expertise from our experts in PhD symposium committee, but also enabling them to collaborate and discuss on the global level. Um, well, we had a really nice session this morning with Opportunity Knox, reflecting on the 30 years of Eden and looking ahead. Um, I would say that uh, we gave uh, some very interesting uh, replies and thoughts, uh, and I'm very uh, help, uh, thankful to Ulf for uh, um, organizing uh, uh, the shaping this session and uh, finding the, the good questions uh, for, for discussion. I'm very happy that we have two new members of Eden Executive Committee, Don Olcott and Willem van Valkenberg, who will join the rest of uh, Executive Committee and continue to work on uh, in Eden uh, in, uh, in the future. Also, my congratulations to the Eden Senior Fellows this year, to Tim, to Diana and to Ulf. And also to the new Eden Fellows, Elena, Mayred, Teresa, Giselle and Daniel. We have this year uh, two uh, rewards for best research paper. One is coming from Croatia, and I always have to say I'm so happy that uh, my colleagues from Croatia are in, in challenging on the on European and global level with their uh, research uh, uh, as well. And one from United States. We gave the Young Scholar Grant uh, this year uh, to the colleagues, uh, to the Young Scholars team uh, from Turkey. And uh, we also uh, have the Young Scholar Best Paper Award uh, again uh, uh, to the... Uh, okay, but just... There are three uh, grants from the Young Scholar. Uh, from Turkey, from Greece and from Germany, but the Young Scholar Best Paper Award uh, went to the Turkey team. And I wish to thank uh, my dear colleague Tim for surviving uh, all the preparations and conference. And I know that it was sleepless nights uh, uh, and very hard work. So now Tim, you know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, uh, I'm really grateful for your all support and, uh, and preparation and for thinking about everything. We exchange number of messages uh, via email or WhatsApp, uh, but uh, I'm certain that everyone will say that organization was on a high level and definitely a great thanks to the Ricardo Mayral, rector of UNED, who agreed that UNED is a host this year uh, of the uh, EVEN conference. Definitely. Uh, my big uh, uh, thank to Beatriz, who made this really great virtual tour of Madrid, enabled us to have the glimpse of Madrid and to feel like that we are there uh, as well. I have to uh, say special thanks to the principal sponsor, the Blackboard uh, uh, and AskMed Solutions. And uh, for the end, I also wish to thank Thank the Secretariat, uh, uh, which was led by Andres Zuc, uh, all colleagues from Secretariat. Big thanks for all support, preparations, and for working uh, whole days uh, to prepare everything uh, what was needed uh, for this conference to be very successful uh, again. And so uh, already uh, some next Eden events. So on the 1st July, we have Child Central Asia webinar. Uh, on 5th July, we have an uh, uh, online together webinar. In the autumn, uh, there is open classroom conference, which is awaits uh, definitely more NAP webinars. And for the November, there is European online and distance learning week. So we as Eden continue to go and uh, join us as uh, uh, Eden member, be part of Eden community in Eden Digital Learning Europe. I'll start to stop sharing because I cannot see uh, any uh, comments uh, in the chat. Otherwise, yes, and I have to say that the the the, the uh, most uh, uh, 
the nicest mannequin of all the conference was the Ratona in virtual uh, Madrid tour. We all remembered uh, this nice little dog. So he he was special. I hope he will get some treats uh, uh, for being the, the member uh, of this video. So I wish to thank you all, to participants, to speakers, to the keynotes, to all those uh, engaged and involved in organization of this conference, I, I can say, and I think that all you will agree that it was very, very successful conference. And now in the end, I got three messages that I have shouldn't forget that we need to take the joint picture. So please, uh, if you don't want that I, uh, I'm uh, on the bed list in the secretariat, please turn on the, the, the cameras uh, so that we have some memories for this virtual online Eden uh, conference. And with this picture, I greet you to the next Eden event. So say smile or cheese uh, for, for the Eden and for uh, our conference. Okay, I hope I hope we, we managed to do it. I'm very happy that with smiles we are finishing this conference and let the smile stay on the face, uh, on your face in the next days. So see you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.